<laughs> nice job. You guys all look excellent. All right. So uh, my name is Ryan Hazen. Uh, this here is Dan Case. Uh, I'm an instructional technologist uh, and Moodle administrator with Carroll College. Dan Case is the Associate Director of Academic Technology at Carroll College, and we're here to talk to you about reflections on active learning classrooms. Uh, so very quickly, I'll explain to you uh, what, we, what we use as an active learning classroom, because these ALCs are everywhere, and there are many different versions. You've got Scale Up and Teal and I don't know what else, all kinds of stuff. Um, but our active learning classrooms, we build in-house ourselves. And uh, basically what we do is we take a wall and we paint it with whiteboard paint. You can see all this white space here is whiteboard paint that you can write on. We put multiple ultra short throw projectors up there, Epson Brightlinks. And we network those projectors so our students can wirelessly access them from their laptop. So any student at any time can put content from their laptop on any one of the screens. We equip them with mobile furniture. You can see these tables there. We've got half moons. We've got rectangles. We've got comfortable chairs. These are all manufactured by Han. Uh, this is just the ones that we found that we like, that we can use, and uh, are, are durable. Uh, this is a six-year-old classroom now, six years into this Seven. thing? Yeah. Seven now. Um, and we found that, that this still looks great. Um, the paint is idea paint. We use Extron equipment in here to do controls for these projectors. And then um, we originally had Mac Minis in there, but since we've gone to fully to the wireless, uh, we don't have resident computers in there at all. Uh, or Well, we have two resident computers, but they're mainly for displaying video content on TVs. So that's, that's the basics of the, the classroom. It's a very inexpensive classroom. Um, Dan says it's $35,000. I say you should budget 50. Uh, so that, that in the lion's share of that is actually the furniture. Uh, so this is a really low bar of entry for an active learning classroom compared to $150,000, $200,000 that we've heard from some other institutions. So that's the classroom. That's great. We can build a classroom. Wonderful. but. How do we see our students learning in it? How do we make the connections between the technology and the way our students think about the content that they're learning in the classroom? More importantly, how do we see the teachers interacting with our students in this classroom? That's what we're here to talk about today. If you want to ask questions about the classroom, we'll be happy to answer them later. We're going to talk about reflections from teachers and from students that have been working in this classroom uh, for some time now. So, when you design instruction within one of these active learning classrooms, you've got two classes of people to think about. You have to think about the teacher. You have to think about the students. Most importantly, you have to think about the interaction between them. I'm going to start this talk by focusing on the teachers. So uh, over the past uh, three years, we've had six faculty formally participate in a professional development program called My Classroom focused on teaching in sandbox classrooms. Now, the My Classroom program I talked about at NWMAT last year encompasses a bunch of other things. We've got 24 faculty participating in this. We have grant funds from the Washington Foundation to stipend them to develop rubrics uh, and uh, intentions uh, for how they're going to use new technologies. But these six faculty focus on sandboxes. And so each three-member faculty group created a rubric that would assess whether or not they met their intentions and then attended those two other classes of the three faculty group to apply the rubric to assess the technology's impact on the class. So we're going from a lecture class to an active learning class, and we're having the faculty create rubrics to assess whether or not they achieved their goals in this transition. So uh, these are the faculty, nice pictures of our faculty at Carroll College. This is uh, Dr. Greiner, she's a theology professor. Dr. Sullivan is a mathematics professor. Dr. Roncalli is a philosophy professor. Dr. Glowinka is a biology professor. Dr. Street's a political science professor. And uh, Dr. Hansen is a communications professor. We specifically wanted to have interdisciplinary groups because we wanted to come out with rubrics and assessments that could be applied across the board and not just have sandbox teaching developed in a silo for mathematics alone. We wanted that math faculty to talk to a theology, to talk to biology, to talk to communications, 
This classroom needs to serve us all, so that's, that's why we built our teacher groups the way that we did. So this group is completed completely in spring 2017, so I'm going to focus in on them. And they had three basic areas that they wanted to talk about. They wanted the sandbox to facilitate student engagement. They wanted to have the technology be necessary but invisible and flexible. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And they wanted opportunities for uh, assessment, specifically formative assessment, as well as differentiated instruction. So let's talk about student engagement. They said when they developed their rubric, so this is one of their criteria, student engagement. And so they developed this rubric, and one of sort of the sub-criteria for this one was peer-to-peer -peer engagement. They were looking for group discussion and interaction with content, and they wanted to privilege higher order thinking. They also, as a part of student engagement, wanted to narrow down transitions so they could seamlessly mode shift. So they go from lecture style to group work to large group work to individual work. They wanted to move through that without wasting any time at all. They wanted to say, can we shift through these modalities without, without that sort of friction that happens uh, when you transition what's going on in the classroom. And finally, cognitive engagement. They wanted to see all levels of Bloom's taxonomy with that privilege on higher order thinking that we were talking about. Uh, also, they wanted a low floor for that cognitive engagement, so it's easy for students to engage with the material, but they also wanted to have a high ceiling. So it's easy to get in engaged in the content, then once you do, they want the top to be open-ended, so the students can go absolutely as far as they possibly can um, once they've gotten involved. So they want to involve all the students, but they want to open the top up so that students can really really um, find themselves at the top of this pyramid as they are able to do. Uh, you're all probably familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. So these teachers wanted to focus on the analytical, evaluative, and synthesis tasks uh, when in the classroom. Uh, we believe just sort of as an ethos in instructional design at Carroll that these levels of Bloom's taxonomy support the ones below. Uh, we kind of inverted the pyramid a little bit. I don't know if anybody's talked about that, but something neat to think about. So we talked about student engagement. Now I want to talk about uh, necessity and visibility and flexibility of the technology. So they asked the question on the rubric, is the technology necessary for the given lesson? Does this room actually need to be there? Because we don't want to build rooms that they're not going to use. Uh, or we don't want to like, build a room that's not absolutely central to the teaching modality that they use. Uh, they asked the question, does the technology interfere with or enhance the learning goals? This is really important in terms of invisibility. This is what we mean. We don't want our students looking at a screen. We want our students analyzing a chart. We want our students critically reading an article. We want our students researching things on the internet. We're not using an iPad. We're researching things on the internet. We're not using our smartphones. We're actively responding to an audience response system. So, uh, when you think about making the technology invisible, this is what we're talking about. And finally, does the space allow for various pedagogical approaches? It's pretty obviously flexibility, right? Uh, finally, the last one, opportunities for assessment and differentiated instruction. Uh, does the technology allow the instructor the opportunity for formative assessment of student engagement and understanding? And does it allow for differentiated instruction and at what levels? Individual, small, and large group. So basically, they take these three criteria in a rubric format with those sub-things that we've just talked about, the sub-criteria. They watch each other teach in the classroom, and then they fill out the rubric to reflect and help those other teachers see whether or not they're achieving their goals. So at this point, we're going to have an opportunity for formative assessment with you guys. So go to todaysmeet.com slash nwmat. You can also scan this QR code right here. Uh, we would be hypocrites if we did not give you the opportunity to engage in some active learning and formatively assess your understanding of what we're talking about so far. So go ahead and do that. And we want you to, in your rows, speak to each other about any one of these topics right here. Just and put yourself in the role of the teacher at this point, right? Yeah, put yourself in the role of the teacher and speak to each other about any one of these topics that suits your row, and have one person from your row respond to this today's meet question uh, with your thoughts on what you do to create student engagement. 
Is technology invisible? How do you facilitate that? And what opportunities do you give your students? How do you give your students opportunities for differentiated uh, instruction and formative assessment? So I, uh, you must turn to your right or left and then speak to each other about these questions. <laughs> and we're going to give you just a couple minutes to do that. <laughs> Oh, you don't need to log in. Yeah, you don't need to log in. Oh, yeah, okay. So there are two E's right here. Delete one of those. There you go. So put your nickname in. Fifteen minutes. That's fifteen minutes. We have fifteen minutes. I think we're on track. What have you done? to meet any of these goals. If you were a teacher, what would you do to provide your students opportunities for assessment or differentiated instruction? What tools would you use? Or maybe you want to talk about student engagement. What would you do to engage students? How do you help professors engage students? Do you use technology to do that? So my question is for you, think about how you would achieve these goals in your own space. And then we're going to compare it to what our teachers say. <laughs> no one's posting anything. All right, so we've had two minutes to talk so far. Go ahead and start to wrap it up in the next minute, and we want responses from uh, at least one person in your discussion group to today's meet. So go ahead and do that now. We just stopped the discussion. I did, I know. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Invisibility. Nice. Are you Stan? Yes. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Finding ways to connect technology together. Furniture first. 
Brian Myers. Hmm? Brian Myers. Type into today's knee. Talk. Oh, well, yeah. You. Sorry, there's the talk side and the listen side. And then you just type in what you want to type say. Type in a name and whatever you want to say. You don't have to yeah. register, log in, don't do yeah. anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right, so you put your nickname in, click join, and then type what you want to in the box that appears down here. Will you demonstrate that for us, Dan? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so todaysmeet.com slash nwmet. Yeah. yeah, you don't need todaysmeet. to sign up or anything, just type in your name. And... NWMET, not NWMeet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got some really good responses in here, I can already tell. And uh, you guys touched on a lot of the concerns that our faculty had when we presented them with the sandbox originally. Uh, Ed just said, I was eavesdropping on you, Ed just said that the people that design the classrooms are not the ones teaching in them. So often we get myopic about this and we're like, we're going to design the classroom and we don't consider what impact that has on the pedagogy and the instructional design that's going to take place in the room. Um, it's very important that we consider this. Uh, because if you don't provide the instructional design support for your faculty, they're not going to use the sweet technology that you put in their rooms. That's it. That's it. You've, so I would, I mean, I think all instructional technologists should be adjuncts. I'm an adjunct instructor at, at Carroll for freshman seminars, so I have to walk the walk too. Um, but let's, uh, let's start at the top, top, Dan, and see what we get here. So is it necessary or just what they want? Uh, evaluate the end objective, not the product recommendation. That's a really good point. We, and that's why when we started with this My Classroom program, we said, teachers, we need you to create a rubric. What is the outcome? That's what we just presented about in the beginning of this presentation, is what is the outcome? What are you trying to get? And then we had to give them the opportunity to circle back around afterwards and say, did you do it or not? Did you make it? Did your instruction change? And was it successful? That's what this whole program was about. Flexibility and several options and connectivity. Um, need space to physically move. This is huge. Why are you scrolling on me, Dan? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of devices. And we love Epson's EZMP software because it works on Chromebooks, Macs, and PCs. The students can show up with their own devices. And as long as they're networked and on the wireless, they can go straight to any projector, and we don't care. So we've got lots of different ways. Oh, and it has mobile apps, too. So if you buy the Epson projector, that EZMP software is a free download. There's a free app for the App Store. And you just get on. And when you're on the wireless network, you put in the IP address of the projector, which it will show to you, and then you go. Um, so yeah, that flexibility is huge. Need space to physically move. It's hard to, it's really difficult to uh, overstate how important it is to have negative space in these classrooms. Uh, Dan gets in trouble a lot with uh, our registrar because why? Because <laughs> they do not want to reduce capacity inside classrooms. You guys all know about that. And so how do you how do you create a flexible active learning space when you keep the capacity at the exact same? That's our big. You need the catch box. Oh, you need the catch box. Yes. Got it right here. Sorry. Catch box. OK, so uh, it's always not always possible to be on the leading edge of technology for every single class. Uh, I say a lot to faculty, you start your city with one brick, and then you add another brick. And brick by brick, you innovate and you change the entire class, right? You can't just say, 
I've seen faculty that say, I'm going to flip my class this summer to make videos, and I'm going to do it. And they make videos. They spend all summer doing it. And then they get to teach the class, and they realize that they did the videos all wrong. And <laughs> they wasted all this time, and they come back, and they're weeping. Well, not quite, but you know. Um, Student engagement doesn't always need tech. This is related to something further down. OK, now I need you to scroll down. <laughs> so if you look down here, somebody talked about uh, the whiteboard markers as being a good low entry point for, um, there we go, low threshold to use the technology. Dry erase pens are a good low standard. It is unbelievable how often we go into these classrooms and none of the projectors are on. It's all whiteboard work. It's just whiteboard, whiteboard, whiteboard from all the way around the room. And we've consistently heard from teachers that those dry erase walls are the most important piece of technology in the room. Um, that, and that, that it's technology, guys. It is. I know. It's not made by Samsung or Apple or anybody, but it's, it's huge. Um, remember smart boards? We do. <laughs> we do remember smart boards. Uh, we still have them in education department, just so we can be nostalgic. Um, and this is interesting, because those Epson projectors are touch interactive. They cast a laser grid over the thing, and you can touch them and interact with them. We unplug the interactivity <laughs> from the, white, from the, the Epson ultra short throw projectors, because teachers would take over all of them and would want students to annotate them differently. So like you're giving a presentation, you have a slide up, and then the different groups can annotate your slides. And they all, you do it differently, which is a wonderful learning experience for everyone. But as soon as you started to touch them, it would advance the slide. And the teacher would lose control. And like, or some student would lean into the laser grid, and the slides would start going <laughs> So yeah, we actually unplugged the little boxes uh, that do the touch interactivity because we wanted them to specifically not be touch interactive. So yeah, we do remember smart boards. And these projectors can do that if you're into that sort of thing. Um, technology integration along with furniture placement aids an in invisibility aspect of the active learning space. Absolutely. It also shrinks the amount of time the teacher said, spends prepping the class. Because we had a professor who said, uh, I don't like these active learning classrooms. I come in, and the furniture's all weird, and people move things around. And another professor said, tell the students to put the furniture how you want them to. <laughs> it takes like 30 seconds. It's like, hey, we need five groups. OK. And the students just move all the stuff around, and there you go. And you're ready to go. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's huge. And invisibility is important to promote ease of use. So uh, those are all really good reflections. Now that we've seen what you guys think, I want to show you a little bit about what our faculty thought um, when they did their reflections. Uh, so here's Dr. Greiner. She's our theology professor that participated in this. Um, so teaching in the sandbox provided me with pedagogical opportunities I would have never considered before. It's hard to overstate the impact that a well-designed classroom will have on the way a teacher thinks about teaching. It changed. It, she didn't know these opportunities existed. Uh, the unique layout of the classroom forced me to think through my use of class time, stretching my pedagogical muscles. I found I was able to integrate differentiated learning in ways that are challenging in traditional classrooms. Differentiated learning is challenging in this room because you're all in equal footing, right? You're all just looking this way, and you're in rows. And But if you can move the furniture and you can make it fun, you can say, OK, I need everybody that responded A to go over here, everybody that responded B to go over here, everybody that responded C to go over here. And you can't stand up. They have to like roll around in their chairs and reorganize themselves. And it's a little team building experience. It's a lot of fun. Letting the students take over the screens and work in small groups gave me an opportunity to hear from students. Invisibility, letting the students take over the screens, OK? That makes the teacher not have to worry about the screens. How many teachers have trouble with PowerPoints and, and projectors and stuff? When the students are in charge of the screens, you just say, Billy, I need, need St. Francis over here, right? And Billy puts St. Francis over here, and Billy's like, I got a laptop. Um, and finally, it gave me an opportunity to hear from more students, especially students who tend to avoid participating in larger group discussions. This is tremendously important for differentiation. We generally think about differentiation in terms of ability. But this is differentiation in terms of social proclivity, right? 
This is where they can say, hey, I, I don't speak in large groups, but when you get into that smaller group, you give the student an opportunity to speak up, especially if you have some way to say, if you're sitting closest to the wall on the right, you're going to answer this question now for your group. So that's like a way to pinpoint someone in every group, and then they, they're the ones that talk, whether or not they're used to speaking. So here's what Dr. Sullivan had to say, math professor. The sandbox fundamentally <laughs> changed the way students engage with the material. Fundamentally changed the way students engage with the material. That's a bold statement from a professor. I had to be very intentional, uh, intentional about daily planning. If I wasn't, I would inevitably fall back on a more lecture-based pedagogy. What I enjoyed about teaching in this classroom was the ability to switch between a lecture and student-centered active learning environment seamlessly with the technology aiding the transition. I've watched Dr. Sullivan do this, and it, it gives me goosebumps. It's crazy. Like, he will lecture, and then he'll turn around, and he'll, like, have, you know, a diagram of his math problem up on the wall that he annotates, and then he'll flip it back and say, okay, take this and do X, Y, and Z with it. You do X, you do Y, you do Z, you do A. And the students then work with it. And then he's like, all right, back here, moving on to the next thing. And so he gives them, he chunks in real time and like gives the students the opportunity to work with the material rather than just listening to it. Being able to see all of the student group's work allowed me to give formative feedback and differentiated instruction throughout every class. This is extremely important, this formative assessment. You guys know the difference? Formative assessment is where assessment's made to help students learn. Summative assessment is the high stakes exam at the end of the course where you get a grade for it. Formative assessment is he's looking at them on the wall and he's saying, oh, guys, 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 this is good, but, you know, you forgot to do the exponent. I don't understand math really well, so <laughs> I don't know what he would say. But imagine me saying something important about mathematics right now. Um, it made the class more engaging for the students and certainly gave me a better sense of where each student was with the material, further guiding my instruction and assessment. That's that formative assessment happening in real time during the lecture. I don't know right now. Well, I've got a pretty good idea because of today's meet, but I don't know who's on the same page with me right now because I'm not actively getting stuff back from you guys. So we're going to change that in a second. Let me get through this first. This is Dr. Roncalli. Uh, she's a philosophy professor. And Dr. Roncalli and I have a great relationship because she's like, I don't, and she wouldn't mind me saying this. So it's, something always goes wrong with technology when Dr. Roncalli's around. It's, she's one of those people that's just, you all know these people. It's never her fault. She never clicked the wrong button. It's like the, somebody unplugged the HDMI cord and she's in there like, it's not working. And it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So the fact that her courage and, and strength and, and work with the sandbox has just floored me, uh, especially because um, she has a lot of experience in, the, in, in a different modalities, so changing this and doing philosophy in this classroom has been amazing. Teaching in the sandbox requires shifting the teaching style from lecture-centered to a more student-centered model. Uh, as a teacher, I see myself as a facilitator in the learning process. I'm there to provide guidance and create the best environment possible for students. That's differentiated instruction for each individual student by engaging the subject matter directly, and that is all about the how. This is where technology comes in. It has enabled me to do more things, new things that I would not be able to do in a traditional classroom. This is a, a common theme. It's things I was not able to do in a traditional classroom I can do in a sandbox. It's also challenged me to think of different ways of teaching and try new things. The benefit of the technology in the classroom is that it allows more direct student engagement for whatever you're doing. And I love this last one. It makes the class more dynamic because you can differentiate instruction and do formative assessment. Flexible, which is talking about invisibility and flexibility, low threshold to entry, and participatory, which is about student engagement. Um, so when we think about how this classroom has impacted teachers' teaching, uh, we see that it's not the technology that's important. What's important is the way the faculty think about their teaching and how they think about their students' cognition. Um, the classroom is important, but it should just invisibly uh, uh, facilitate the teacher's transformation in that way. Um, so we're going to switch over to students now. And I'm going to let Dan talk about students. You want to do? Sure. Yeah, no, I can just take this. I got this over here. OK. I'm good. Um, 
Yeah, so from the student standpoint, um, I did a study coming up next um, where we, we did a big questions out survey for, for all the students to see just what they felt about it. Um, we got students from all different um, groups, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and um, they were all immersed in one of these active learning classrooms for a semester. And so the big question for us is, do these things make a difference? You know, we're building these things. Teachers like them. Do students really care in that instance? So um, we asked them, how much does the teaching differ in this type of room compared to a traditional room? And this is the response we got. Um, number one is, does it matter much? Um, number five is obviously vastly different. And so that was right off the gap, right off the get go. Um, so these are some of the quotes that we got back from students, um, things that they were saying about the rooms. And I want you to notice that here, one student said, a traditional lecture does not work well in this room. And there actually have been some studies that have shown that, that you stick a traditional teacher in an active learning classroom, your actually outcomes can be less. Um, so be aware of that. Um, and so getting those teachers and faculty trained in the active modality is key to making it successful. Um, here's some student engagement. And again, our classrooms are built with projectors and the, the ability to not use technology at all inside the classrooms as well. And so here we, you kind of see that. Obviously, the great help, whiteboard paint on the walls, multiple, multiple projectors. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Um, flexibility of the furniture and the comfort of the, of the seating. So those were the key highlights, takeaways from the students. Um, my battery's about ready to go down. Huh. Do we have a power cord for this thing? I don't know. Um, so, and in here, um, there's a couple more students' um, responses. And again, what we notice is the whiteboards became the key thing. And so a lot of the faculty that taught in these active learning classrooms, which are very technology-based, would only use a technology probably half of the time. The other half of the time, they're not using the technology. And I'm OK with that. I didn't build a $100,000 room, so they just had to use technology for the whole time. You got to empower the faculty. And sometimes it's better to not use any technology at all. And you just want to go group work or do things. So these allow us to do both of that. And we talk about flexibility of things. Again, multiple projectors. Um, but the writing on, the, on multiple walls for projection always seems to trump everything for us. That seems to be the, the, the key. And so by, by projecting onto those whiteboard walls, if they don't use the technology, we didn't lose anything. We didn't lose any space. It's just an additional component in the room. And so you can use it or you can not use it. And we really don't care either way. Um, and again, here was some other um, comments back from the students about some of the things that they were saying about the rooms. So, um, so basically, yeah. So this went back to our room again. So the key thing is we build these classrooms. We all do it. We all know that we've got these classrooms. But don't forget that the classroom itself is not important. It's how you see your students interacting with the technology. It's how you see it, students, more importantly, thinking about the content that's in the room. And the biggest question that you need to ask yourself as a manager of educational technology is how are you going to facilitate the change in the way that the teacher thinks about their teaching in that classroom. All right? So thanks a lot. I have special 20 met bucks. I'm going to distribute these for Twitter activity, OK? So you tweet good questions at me right now. You might just have a chance. Also, we'll distribute them for excellent questions or comments here physically in this room. Uh, it's because we want to start, fundamentally, we want to start a conversation about this. We're active learning evangelists, not lecture evangelists. So catch box to the people that need them. <laughs> when, when we were talking, we were wondering if in the rooms, how you knew how many short throw projectors or stations to have in there, how was that determined? Because it looked like you had like six or so or whatever. And if it was necessary to have six or if you could have just one. Yeah, so if we try to, we try Hold to on, break Ed. the capacity. Oh, sorry. 
we're trying to break the capacity down. So the capacity is, you know, 40. Then we're looking at groups of five or six, and then, then that determines how many projectors we try to fit in the room. So we try to keep those groups somewhat about that size. That seems to be the sweet spot for us. Um, it's not always possible, but we try our best to get that. So we've got one room that has six, seven projectors and two televisions. So it's got nine stations, uh, seats 44 students, and then we've got smaller ones than that. We want to we, we want to continue to scale them too. We think this is totally scalable. Where are we going? You're up. Did you guys talk about the my classroom program, like at a programmatic level, kind of how that's structured and came about? I mean, one of the things that we struggle with is we want faculty to engage on our classroom designs, but often that engagement doesn't happen until we finish building the classroom, and <laughs> it's hard to do much from that point. So how are you guys proactively engaging? What does that program look like? So initially. Um, and there's, I think there's a stream of this talk I did last year at NWMED about just about the program, 10,000 foot view of what we're doing with my classroom. In a nutshell, uh, the president of the college came to us and said, wouldn't it be neat if every student had an iPad? And we were like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, we couldn't just say that. Uh, so what we did was we, uh, took a careful look at it. We got 12 faculty, uh, gave them iPads, and had them engage in um, using them in the classroom, and found that, they, that the device itself didn't really have the, the impact. But the teacher said, my thinking about this in the room with other faculty actually was really valuable. So um, in order to facilitate buying the iPads and stipending the teachers to do this, we went to the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, which is an education-focused uh, foundation. And you know, we wrote a grant proposal for $20,000 a year and uh, over three years. And so we said, we're going to stipend faculty $400 for a semester to participate in this. And then they're going to have a few hundred dollars as well if they need to buy a license to something like Nearpod or they need to, like, if they do need an iPad or they need a Chromebook or whatever, we're going to have those funds to, to, to make that work. So, well, you know, let's just, we've got these funds, let's use them. Um, and so, but after we did the initial pilot with the iPads, we said we want groups of three interdisciplinary faculty, each of them get stipend of $400. They're going to collaborate around a particular technology or technique. They're going to create a rubric to evaluate it. They're going to evaluate each other at least two times. And then they're going to write a reflection at the end of the year. So we're actually paying the faculty to do this, which I, is very important. You have to stipend faculty to do these sort of things because they need an incentive. And granted, $400 is not a whole lot of money. It's not like we're giving them a, a big big boost, right? But it's that, that consideration is important, that they're doing extra work that they weren't going to do otherwise. And we want to make sure that they understand that we value that. Um, so we, we did that with the sandbox classrooms, with Nearpod, with Moodle discussion forums, with Moodle quizzing, with um, video production, flipping the classroom. Uh, so we, had all, we have all these faculty groups, little groups of three interdisciplinary faculty doing all these different things at once under this one big umbrella. Um, so that's, that's the way it works. It's work in addition to their, their classwork, and then uh, we facilitate that from the administrative level through academic technology, help them develop the rubrics, and then we kick out a report at the end of every year, which this year wound up, this is a big 45-page PDF of all the rubrics, all the statements of purpose, all the evaluations, all the reflections, and I can share that with you guys. So. And Colin, back, back to your question about the classrooms themselves. Um, when I built the Sandbox classroom, we built it like seven years ago. It was just an idea, and it wasn't a standard classroom. It was separate from a standard classroom, so I could experiment in it. So I brought in faculty members. What do you like? What don't you like? What, what works? What doesn't work? And we only did it as kind of like a, um, you have a regular scheduled class. You can, bring, you can come into this space for a couple weeks, try it out and then go back to your regular schedule class. So it was this kind of, and then I modified it. So the way it looks like today is vastly different than what I started out with. And so it's continually changing based upon faculty and, and student feedback, so. And are you getting like, data that's informing those changes as you put new things in? Working Definitely, yeah. I mean, and, and it, it's anecdotal data, yeah, really. Like, yeah, I mean, we used to have six, you know, six computers in there, one at every station. 
you know, everybody's going wireless. I'm like, why do I have six computers in here? So I just pull everything out. And so I'm end up putting things out. So right now, if we built one, we would just put a projector on the wall and plug it in the network. That's it. And put a, you know, on-off button on it and, and, and then call it good. Um, and then just design the classroom that way. Because it, it's changed. And we've had some mobile stations now for teachers. They wanted somewhere to put their stuff and move around. That's something that we added. And we've added some you know, other things here and there. But uh, the big thing for us is sound right now. We're trying to deal with the sound issue and Bluetooth. So that's what we're dealing with. So, I don't know. Go. You're up. Ryan, are you? Is this a uh, call, open call for volunteers, participation from faculty? Is it voluntold? Is it deans or department heads assigning? How, how do you get the involvement other than the stipend? With any uh, program uh, with faculty on campus, it's all of the above. I <laughs> don't care at all. Like, I send out the emails and say, if you want to participate in this, let me know. If you have a technology you want to explore. And sometimes one person will get back and say, I want to try out Nearpod. I saw it at a conference. Or I know that this guy uses it over in science. Or I saw somebody do this with it. And then from there, I, in the administrative role, will go and seek out the other people to do it. I just hit the pavement. Every time I see somebody on campus that I think is a good candidate for this, I'll pitch it to them, say, hey. I got, you know, Dr. Smith over here who wants to do this thing with Nearpod. I think you should be in the group too. Um, here's what Nearpod does. Get out your phone. I'm going to give you a demo right now, you know. And they'll get on and I'll run them through a Nearpod thing. I'll say, look, I see I can see your drawings and I can do, and check this out. I'm going to send it back to you and it'll like, so yeah, it's, it's both volunteer, uh, voluntold, and well, there's, not, there's no voluntold, actually. I really focus on grassroots. I try not to tell faculty to do anything. I'm, I'm a servant to them, and I try and make them know that at all times. Um, so I would, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll lean on you and try to convince you that it's the right thing and, you know, that it's going to change your teaching. And if you don't, that's, you need to write that in the report. And I'm not going to filter what you, the faculty, say in the report. That's totally contrary to what I'm trying to do. If you try this Nearpod thing and you don't like it and you want to write a scathing takedown of Nearpod, I'm going to publish it with everything else. Like uh, That's the whole point. And then I'm going to hand it off to the other faculty and they're going to be able to read it and maybe it's a, it's a garbage technology. I mean, there's a lot of ed tech out there right now and not, not all of it is good. And so if that's what comes out, then yeah, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna email it to all faculty just like I emailed all the stuff you saw in here to all faculty. We haven't had that happen yet. We've had some people that are like, this glitch makes it if we can solve this, this is a really good thing. And we've just solved those problems. So it's been a real good systematic way for us to identify how to overcome hurdles that a teacher operating in isolation might not be able to overcome because we're working together and can figure it out. Can we throw it back to Gary there? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So all the professors that were teaching in that, all three of them were wireless. So they were you know, bringing their laptops. There wasn't an installed computer. Yeah, um, they all bring in their own laptops. Uh, we provide laptops to in the, those usually. Um, and so, yeah, they're all bringing in their own laptops and going wirelessly. Epson EZMP allows you to project a, up to four projectors at once. So if they do want to get into that lecture modality and teach in the holodeck, you know, from Star Trek, uh, they can do that. And uh, that's the, so their computers are, con are connected in the same way that the students are. And Dan and I will come in at the, for about 15 minutes at the beginning of a semester for any given sandbox class and get the students rolling with EZMP. We come in and write on the board, that's an EZMP. And then, you know, search it and download it. And then we walk around and troubleshoot. And I'm telling, man, I've gotten really good with every operating system's little quirks of this particular install. Because, you know, you've got a, on Windows 10, you're going to find an EXE file here. And on Mac, you've got to go to the Finder and all that stuff. So. so just to follow on with that, was that a change for any of those professors? Were they used to teaching with an installed computer and not a laptop? And how did that go? All of them yeah. were used to teaching. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're working on that. We're trying to get teachers to move to laptops, and so they walk into X classroom, do their stuff, close laptop, walk out. That's what we'd like to have. Um, in reality, it doesn't quite work that way. So we typically have one 
computer still in, inside the classroom that's installed, the physical computer. And if they need to use that, then, then that's fine. They can just do that. And they can also then take that computer and wirelessly go to four other screens with that one as well. So they can be in the holodeck or whatever. So, do you have a question? What uh, devices do your students use, and do you make accommodations for when students may not have a device? We do. They, uh, oh, so I'll so have another question say that again after that. Quick. What, devices do, they what use? devices do your students use? Do you, do you mandate a certain device for your students, and what do you do if a student doesn't have a device that would be compatible? Well, uh, this this one's located in the library, and we have checkout Chromebooks, which work great with this. And do you want to talk about the? Yeah, so we don't manage anything. So you can bring a, you can bring a PC, you can bring a Surface, you can bring a Mac. It doesn't matter. You can Chromebook. A large device or would a cell phone be fine for you? Would a, what now? So would you would you need students to have a large screen device or would they be able to use a cell phone? As well? You can use a cell phone. Um, you can't. You can mirror an Android device up there. Uh, the one kick caveat is iOS. iOS is locked down to the Apple. So outside of a, outside of a phone, you, any device can go up there and mirror. So. Any Android device or any Chromebook or PC or Mac. So we figure, I mean, there's still not that one dongle that rules them all that we're waiting for. Um, that's an Apple deal, but so until that comes. We, we use Kramer boxes. Okay. We're using or working somewhat so far. Somewhat. I know. And, that, and that, see, that's the kicker. So, <laughs> but that's just another device that we got to plug into the projectors. That's more devices we got to buy, we got to support. That takes up one more HDMI port in the back of them that we got to power and everything else. So. We're just put the projector on the wall, plug it in. That's the only device that we use. So that's the one HDMI port, and then we do everything. Only need it right, right through the, the camera box. box. Yeah. Switch from there. Oh, okay. But when I have seven or eight projectors per room, that's a lot of camera devices. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do a quick Twitter question. Mark asked, how do we go about getting funding for the sandbox? Dan, you can answer that really quickly, I bet. Uh, I Pitch it to a donor. <laughs> um, yeah, donor came through, and uh, he's a newspaper guy, and he wanted to do something. And I said, hey, I got this idea. And I didn't even know what I was doing. I had just kind of finished doing regular rooms and wanted something different. And so he's like, well, I don't really get what you want to do, but sure, here's some money, and, and, and go for it. So that, that's how kind of it all started, really. And Randy from Twitter, real quick. Um, where's Mark, first of all? Yeah, and Randy says, what preparation training is provided to the instructors in support of using the rooms and changing, changing the structure of their courses? Um, I do what I like to call technology therapy with faculty. They come to my office. They sit down in the office, and we talk it through. My office has whiteboards all the way around it. Uh, I've got a big computer and a bunch of different colors. And we'll start with that question, what do you want to do? Well, I want to use the sandbox. No, 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 no. What do you want your students doing in their heads? What cognitive work do you want your students doing in the sandbox? And once they articulate that, then we can start designing the activities that they're going to do in the classroom. Um, and then the, it's incredibly important that they evaluate each other based on this rubric, because then they go into each other's rooms. And maybe they weren't art able to articulate a learning objective that I would come up with that they would do this, but they'll see another teacher do it and then uh, go from there. So it's both technology therapy and pedagogical therapy. Now, you've got to have a teacher in the role to do this. Uh, my, I've got an MED, and I was an eighth grade teacher. That's like my pedigree. Um, so you, you have to have somebody who's who's d done that and knows how it works uh, in order to do this sort of therapy. Because uh, it's techno-pedagogical, it's a, it's a blend. It's a hybrid. They've got one foot in, in both areas. So that's the prep that they get. Uh, and then we follow that up with continuing development by making them talk to one another. So we're going to go here, and then we'll get you guys next. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> Randy asked my question, essentially. Oh. It was about how do you support your teachers in, in design change and uh, so um, so yeah and, in that. a nutshell that's that's what you do and then I'll come into the room too that, that can't be under under yeah. uh, estimated how important that is as we'll actually come into the room when these lessons are happening so that if things fall apart we're there to patch it up um, and that gives them a lot of confidence in terms of going forward what if the projector turns off randomly well we'll reboot it it'll be fine all right 
So you talked about the teachers telling you how their perspective on teaching changed, but did any of the students uh, extensively talk about how their perspective on learning changed? You can talk into that mic up there, Dan, I think. Long talk into that. Oh, well, here you go. Oh. Oh. Unless you just want to catch this. Yeah, no, no, no. Yes, um, no, so we, we, we've been remiss in that, I think, in, in, in some ways. Um, we've been focusing mainly on the, on the teachers, and so now we're trying to bring it back and to get more, more input from the, from the actual students. And what we've seen is that we're not quite sure if students walk into this space and their expectations are different. Like, I'm just, this is going to be cool, I'm going to learn differently, and then when it doesn't happen, they're like, that, that's not very good. Um, and, or the actual learning is different, and they're, they're benefiting from that. And so we have to differentiate those two things. So that's something that we're, we're in the process of, of getting more information on. <laughs> no, yeah, I'll take that back if you don't ask a question. Um, I was curious about the role of your LMS throughout this project, like how you're supporting faculty with making uh, corresponding or related changes. LMS is uh, central to our instructional design, <laughs> absolutely central. We and think of uh, Moodle. We use Moodle uh, and we self-host it on campus, so we have complete administrative control of it. Um, I get to do that. and. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we really like Moodle because it is the most flexible, dynamic learning management system on the planet. Um, and I don't want to knock the other ones, but I'll, I'll say that when people say they have trouble with Moodle because it's too complex, it's complex because it gives you more options than the other learning management systems. Proprietary learning management systems sell themselves fundamentally as we've simplified the learning management system. Finally, I think the the the, the Start, founder of Canvas has a picture of himself dressed up like Paul Revere, like he came writing in, a new solution is here. Uh, but what they did was they stripped away a lot of the features, a lot of the adaptivity, a lot of the flexibility of the grade book, a lot of the, um, the add-ons that Moodle can facilitate real life uh, interaction. So a lot of times you'll see students logged into Moodle on the screen. The teacher will say, group the students in Moodle and say, look on Moodle to see what group you're in. And then this group can see this thing, and I want them to put it up on their, that thing on their screen, and this thing on that screen, and this thing on the other screen. So not only does Moodle facilitate the prep as they come into class, like do these activities before you come in, it facilitates the work in class, and then it facilitates the reflection afterwards. So it's all one thing. We think of the digital and physical learning spaces as the same space. I think so, we just need to do one more question. One more question. Yeah. Grace. I don't know if I want to give Grace any. How much are you giving me? Just 20. That's it? <laughs> uh, well, before you guys uh, design this classroom for active learning, um, what, do you have those questions still that you could possibly share with us or with me before I start um, having a focus group in certain um, department? The reason why I'm asking at Boise State, we have an imagination room. It's really collecting dust right now. Um, but I don't want to make any rec recommendation because ultimately it's the College of Business and Economics faculty members who are going to be using this. But if you have those questions, would you possibly, when you ask the faculty, would you possibly, do you still have them for you guys to share? We do, yeah. And, and Ryan's, Ryan's got all the information. And in fact, you almost go back to the faculty and have the faculty create their own rubric that's going to be assessed against, right, Ryan? What's that? You go back and redo the rubrics, did you say? No, you have the faculty and then they create their own rubrics for how they're going to do it. So we start with a couple of questions. And you've got some questions, obviously, when, you, when they walk into his office that he, that he Right. Maintains. So yeah, we start with, uh, I make them use Bloom's verbs to describe what they want their students to do. That's how they articulate their learning objectives. And then when we start the rubrics for the next group, like the second group, uh, the second sandbox group that's working this semester, they started with the rubric that the previous group, and they met with the previous group and sort of talked it through. So there's a framework that then they then build on. And what we want at the end of the day is a Carroll College sandbox teaching rubric that has been hit in all of the departments that they've all agreed on and had collaboratively developed. So when they ask that question, how do I teach in this classroom, we can give them a rubric that says, this is what you need to focus on. Great. All right, that's all the time thank, we have. Thanks thank, a lot. thank you so much. Appreciate it.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.